Today we are continuing our subject matter found in the 23rd Psalms where we are dealing with the fact or the idea of the guide and the traveler. We have already looked at verse 1 where David dealt with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now we found ourselves in verse 2 and he's been discussing and he's been teaching us in essence the thought of the guide and the traveler. The concept of the guide and the traveler means now that we are the Lord's, we belong to him. Now as believers, we follow the Lord. So now he's been teaching and he's been bringing some things to our mind and our thought about this 23rd Psalms. So today we're going to pick up from where we left off at last week. And of course, we will have to go back to verse 1 because we can't leave verse 1 because the whole text is basically centered around verse 1. Amen. Technical difficulties have become beyond my control. The camera ain't on. <laughs> Jesus say, let there be light. I'm going to say, let there be camera. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, okay. We gon' if you don't mind, we're gonna get ready and we're gonna have prayer, then we're gonna get started here. You clear all your hearts and minds and bow your heads, we'll talk to the master. Our Father and our God, we enter your throne of grace this morning with a with a heart of thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you for the things that you've done in the lives of this, your people. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And, and we thank you for the, the, the love that you had for this, your people, that you sent your son to Calvary's cross to die for our sins. And now, Father, as we begin to study this, your word, first and foremost, Father, we ask you to forgive us for our sins and our iniquities. Forgive us for the wrong thoughts that we have in our heads. Forgive us for the wrong actions that we walk in. Most of all, forgive us for misuse of time and talent, God, and just taking you for granted. Forgive us for our unfaithfulness to you because you're such a faithful God. Now we pray over the saints of the house. We pray for the saints of the church of God, for all your saints all over the land. We pray that you comfort them, guide them. We pray that you put your hedge protection around us as you always have, Father God, and just keep us in your will. Now we ask that your spirit be with us. We pray that you anoint the hearts and the minds of this, now your hearers and believers. Open our eyes that we may see you open our ears that we may hear you and most of all just be in our presence today and we'll be ever so careful to give you all praise honor and glory for us in Jesus name we ask it all let every heart say amen, amen. our text we're looking at today comes out of Psalms 23 2 through 4 but I actually need you to see Psalms 23 and 1 and we're going to 23 2 through 4 as usual, I need you to make your declaration again this morning of what we are doing. So we're going to start out at verse 23 and 1 and read along with me, if you don't mind. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, this declaration was made, or we have made it several days, and we're going to continue to make it because I think that's one of the major issues of believers. We don't actually declare who we are and whose we are. The major issue is, is, I said it before, and I go to my grave saying it, that we have to put God in his rightful place. Yeah. We, have, we have destroyed him. We have made him of null effect in our lives, but not made God of null effect. Don't leave here and say, shall I say, we made God weak. We haven't made God weak, but he's weak in our lives because of the way we treat him. So because the way we treat him that way, we don't go to him like we should, and we don't reverence him like we should. So... The issue, the thought of mine is we have to make sure we keep in our mind that the Lord is my shepherd. When the text moved along, it says, I shall not want. Now, we understand that when we study this particular text, when he says, I shall not want, the word want here actually means lack. He says, I won't lack nothing if the Lord is my shepherd. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I'm not lacking. So when David made that declaration of promise, then he moved to verses 2 through 4, and he began to discover and discuss why he's not in lack, the things he's not in lack for. Read verse 2 with me, if you don't mind. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
he leads me beside the still waters. In that thought or in that idea, he's beginning now to make a list why he does not want. The, the, the text is actually teaching us, David says this, because the Lord is my shepherd, I know he's going to take me to light in green pastures. He says he's going to lead me beside the still waters. So we come to the idea of the thought of the guide and the traveler. We talked about this. God is leading his people now in the direction that he wants us to go. Now, in that particular thought, we looked at several facets, and we looked at several things about this. First and foremost, we said that the word was contemplative, and we, said we started looking at what it meant. When we talked about contemplative, it says it means it's a thought process. It's a thinking thing. When you come to Christ, you come to him thinking. You don't come to him in action. You actually come to him in thought first. When I say you came to him in thought first, he says this, you entered into him with a rest. So it says the first thing that happened is the shepherd rests his sheep. Now, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, we see it's the text read, Come to me, all who will labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We talked about the idea that rest is the beginning of Christianity. Yes. When we talk about rest, I'm not talking about sleep. I'm not talking about slumber. I'm talking about resting in him. Yes. When you rest in him, that means yes, I give all I have over to him. My problems, my words, my fights, my frustration, my everything I got going on is in his hand. Why is it in his hand? Because he's my shepherd. And I shall not want. See, I ain't worried about nothing. That's why I'm giving the battle to him because he's the shepherd. If you can keep it in your mind that because he is the Lord, the creator of life itself, then he's all powerful and he's the only one that can actually take care of you. So, we can't get away from verse 1 as we go through 2 through 4. So he says this. He says we have to enter into his rest. I left you with a thought last week, and I asked you a particular thing. I asked you, are you resting in Christ? Are you actually resting in Christ? Have you given, have you submitted your life to Christ? We, do, do you give him everything, or do you hold some things back for yourself? See, do you think you still have to fix some problems and have to handle some things yourself? Or do you realize God says when you rest in him, you give me everything? He says, I'm going to give you a new burden. Give me yours, I'm going to give you mine. He says, you won't carry your burdens, but you can carry mine because my burdens are better for you. So what he wants us to understand is he says, if you're not resting in him, you need to start making some adjustments in life. Learn to give things over to Christ. Quit, quit carrying loads that you weren't meant to carry. We're carrying things in the world, and it's not meant for us to carry. We made problems, we created problems, and we can't carry the problems we created. And, and, and if you just think about life as it is, pandemics and, and wars and all these things going on, we weren't meant to deal with God actually directed wars when wars were, when we fought wars, God put us in the war and God fought with us. Matter of fact, he fought for us. But man comes along and we start things on our own behalf because we're not resting in him. See, it's quite natural in the natural senses. When things start to go in good, you kind of start forgetting about who your Lord is. See, when God starts to bless his people, his people start to forget about him. We fail the need to want to talk to him. We fail the need to want to pray to him. We fail the need to come congregate with him. Look around. Look, just look around now. Yeah. See, there was a time when people didn't have good jobs. People didn't have good clothes to put on, and they packed houses. They packed houses with overalls on, was no microphones, was no air conditioners, with no heaters, and they packed the house down. Air conditioners with windows that raised up and down, and some of the old churches didn't even have windows. Flies flying in around you, bothering you, but you still came to him because you were resting in him. See, when you get blessed with things, you have to be careful how you handle blessings because blessings will mess you up. Blessings are good, but they will mess you up if you don't take them the right way. We walked to church. We got up and left early so we could walk to church. When I was a kid, I walked to church. I didn't catch no bus. I didn't ride to church. I walked to church and was there on time. We got cars. Now, God has blessed us with cars, and we won't get to church on time. Well, when we talk about this resting in Christ and looking to Christ for everything, that's one of the major issues. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Until we learn to put God in his rightful place, we'll never look at him in the rightful place. I can't see him like he is because I don't see him at all. 
Well, listen to this thought. Listen to this thought where we're moving with this. So today says this. Last week we talked about the text, and he says what, what God said in this text. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. When we talked about the text, we mentioned the thought that how does a God who gives us free will make us do anything? Would he break his covenant and say, I'm going to make you do this, but you can do everything else on your own? Yeah. He'd, be, he'd be violating his own laws and be violating himself, and he can't do that. Yeah. God will never lie to us, and he'll never break his promise to us. So he says, I'm not going to make you do this. But listen what goes on. What David is declaring here, David is saying it like this. Listen as we move on in the story. Watch what David says. Since God never forces us to do anything, why would David say it? Listen to the thought. Since David said he makes me because he knows this, David says the shepherd could change the circumstances around the sheep that will bring out the changes he knows was in the sheep. What he does is this. He's not actually making you do anything, but he's changing your circumstances to make you come to him. In other words, says, a lot of you wouldn't be here in the, in the world today, in Christianity today, if God didn't throw some roadblocks in front of your life. When you was in the club still turning it up for what? God had to touch you in the club and do some things to you to make you come in here. He didn't make you come to Christ, but he changed your circumstances that brought you to him. So what David says is when he makes me to lie down in the green pasture, David says he put me in the midst of hell and high water that I want to be with him. And that's what, that's what he says. So he didn't make me do it, but he changed my circumstance. How many of you have he changed your circumstance? How many of you here because he changed your circumstance? You didn't come because you wanted to come to him. He changed your circumstance. He changed what you was going through. He changed the way you were thinking. He changed what you were doing. A lot of us thought worldly things was all we needed. And God showed us that the world ain't going to give you nothing but the world. The world has no eternal reward in it but hell and damnation. So, so listen, 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 listen to what he says. So in other words, the shepherd knows that it was hard for the sheep to pass a changed circumstance. David says it was, it's hard for a sheep to see a different circumstance and go by. When God started showing us different, we couldn't walk past it. See, because we knew where we were and what we were doing. See, you understood that that, that glaucoma medicine wasn't really fixing you. It wasn't solving the problem. Temptations taught us that. On cloud nine, you could be what you want to be. But when it wore off, you were back there on the earth with us. See, when I was out there, when I was, when I was, when I was fixing my eyesight and doing what I was doing, I didn't have no problems. But a couple of hours later when that wore away, and all my problem was saying, I'm here. I'm here. What you going to do about this bill? What you going to do about this problem you got? What about that? See, that goes back to resting in him because when you turn your problem over to him, he fixed the problem. Watch, watch, watch what he says. Watch what he says. So in other words, when he talks about he makes me to lie down, he says he, put, makes, he makes circumstances that favor me. Now, the third thing that must be made clear is that the shepherd knew that it's almost impossible. It's almost impossible that the sheep be made to lie down. God means good for each and every one of us. He wrote it in his word, and he makes sure his word reaches each and every one of us. But we walk by it every day and will not rest in him and not walk in his word. He says, it's hard to get my people to do right. He says, I, I got the best form. How, he says, how many times I love to call you in, but you just won't do right. I bring you out of the world. I save you. And you still don't want to come. It's hard to get you to enter into my rest. God says, I'm offering you. When you be born again, when you accept Jesus, your Lord and Savior, he has opened the door, open invitation to come into his rest. And we resist his rest. We accept salvation, but we don't want the rest. I want salvation, but I still want to finish some things up I was doing and I get back with you. I, 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 I ain't ready to come yet, Lord. I'm, I'm coming, but I got some things I want to do. I'm, I'm coming, Lord. I, I still need to holler at this person over here, but I'm going to be there. He said, we, we still have those issues that we don't want to enter his rest. It's hard to get a Christian to come in. It's, and, and, and God said, it's, it's, David knew this when he wrote it because David was a shepherd. David says, to get a sheep to lie down in green pastures, you have to make the conditions ideal. Have to be ideal conditions to get you to come in. See, I'm offering you a coming. I'm sending you an invitation, but you drag your feet about coming. 
You drag your feet because some requirements going to have to be met to get you to come in. David's going to give us some requirements. He's going to talk about some things that makes us see it in a different light. He says, it's, it's my four requirements need to be met. He says, the shepherd knows that the sheep will not lie down unless first thing first. They are free of all fears. See, a fearful animal will not rest. When a sheep is, when a sheep is in fear, it's skittery, it's skittish, it runs. It can't rest because it's steady worrying about what's coming around him. He can't drink, he can't eat because he's worried. When you're in fear, you can't live right either. See, when you're scared of things in life, you make bad decisions, you make mistakes, and you're on edge. You can't rest. You lay down, but you can't sleep. You, you, your, your rest is broken when you're in fear. Right. If you've ever been actually truly afraid of something, you know that you can't sleep. Right. Oh, you lay down. Oh, you may close your eyes a while. You sleep, but you wake up feeling tighter than you were when you didn't sleep. Because fear can do some things to you. God will tell us this in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 tells us this right here. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Look at that text. Look at that text before I start tearing it apart. I want you to hear exactly what he just got through saying. For God has not given you. He didn't give it to you. But he didn't say it wasn't going to be here. He just said he didn't give it to you. It's in the earth. Believe it or not, it's been in the earth. And you know why it's in the earth? It's because of the earth, because of the curse. If you don't know it, if you want to hear about it, you want to believe it, you want to go back and read it, if you look at Genesis chapter 3, I think, verse 8 through 10, it'll tell you about David when they ate the apple. Not David, Adam and Eve, when they ate of the apple, he hid from God. And when God called him in the cool of the day, he says, uh, Adam, where are you? He says, why are you hiding? He said, because I'm afraid. He said, because I'm afraid. Fear then entered into the natural lives of men and women. That's when fear came into our life. So fear is a natural thing. It belongs to all of us. We actually operate in it. But listen to what he says. I ain't even through. I ain't even getting started good. But listen to what he just got through saying. If first in the text he talks about this spirit of fear. This, this, what is the spirit of fear that he's talking about? The Greek word, which can also be translated as timidity. Timid, timid, timid. You know what it means to be timid. You understand being how it has with Timmy when you're on the edge all the time, you look around. Well, the sheep, that's what happens to the sheep. I'm trying to lead the sheep and get them to come to the pastures where the pastures are green. Everything is ideal for them, but they can't rest there because they got too much going on. Yeah. Yeah. They're scared. They're still jumping and running from what they ain't got no business fighting in the first place. Because you said, the Lord is your shepherd. You shall not want. You shouldn't be having no problem with this. Right. Yeah. David is teaching us a lot of times what our mouth say and what our body do ain't the same. Well, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it, what he says. This word, this word, this word, spirit of fear, it denotes a cowardly, shameful fear caused by a weak, selfish character. Look what he just said, a weak, selfish character. In other words, he said, the problem lies in you. It's on you. God is making a way, but you won't, you won't walk into it. He says, it's a weak character that you carry. Not man. God said, I didn't give it to you. That came from the world, and now you taking it and you holding on to it like a dog with a bone. Won't let it go. He says this right here. Look what he says in the text. For God, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but, 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 but. He's now laying out the opposite of what I did give you. I didn't give you fear, but I'm going to show you what I did give you. See, I tried to give you this, but you want that. You want this, but I want you to have that. How many times have you chose something that God didn't want for you? You shacked up with somebody now you ain't supposed to be with because you chose something that you weren't supposed to have. You married him, you stuck with him, and now you're trying to make it work, talking about he loves me, and you're coming to church, or you're going to work with two-piece meals on you every day. Face all doctored up and two-piece, that means the left and the right, pop, pop. beat you all up and, and running you in the ground, killing your self-esteem, making your life miserable, and you won't let it go. Save people trying to hook up with unsaved people and make them, and you can't do it. You can't save them because you say you can't make them come. 
millions of households in the world today, half and half, half believe, half go to church, half at home going to Bed Spring Baptist. Instead of trying to tell the half that's going there, I ain't got to go to church to be saved. I ain't got to be there. Listen, look at what he said. Look at what he said. Let's go back. Let's go back. I don't get too far off track. He said he's showing us a direct parallel, a direct opposite of what's happening. He gives us a but because everybody should have a but in their life. You should have a but in your life. And I ain't talking about what you're sitting on. I ain't talking about that but. But you should have a but in your life. I was lost, but now I'm found. See, I didn't believe, but now I do. You got to have a butt in your life. If you ain't got a butt in your life, you better question yourself where you at. So look what he says. Look what he says. He says, but I've given you a spirit of power. Power is basically a positively God has already given believers. God has gave all believers this spiritual resource that they need for every trial and for every threat. God has given us power to walk in. He says, I gave you power. You, you shouldn't be afraid of nothing. I gave you what you should need. You want me to back it up? Let's go to our sponsors in Matthew 10, verse 19 and 20, and let's see what it says. It says, but when they deliver you up, don't worry about how, you, about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. He says, we have no reason to worry about anything, even as minute as how to speak and how to talk about God. He says, God will work your lips just like that little ventriloquist dummy if you rest in him. He'll give you the right words to say at the right time to the right people. He ain't going to make you have to force it out your mouth. You ain't got to try to scratch your head to understand what to say. When you're resting in him and you know him, you'll speak his word. Amen. He says, this spirit of power that I want you to understand is, he says this, I'm giving you everything you need. Right. We're weak as people. Christians have become weak because we don't want to rest in God and walk in his power. To rest in him is another facet of turning yours over to him and taking his. I'm giving you my little weak power, and I'm taking your great power. See, God has all power. He's in charge of it all, but instead we still, still want to run things. And because we want to run things, we run ourselves in the ground. It's a bad thought. It's a bad thought. It's a bad thought. But even under power, he actually brings up another thought, and it says not only just gives us a spirit of power, but we have a spirit of divine power. And this is effective, productive, spiritual energy, and it only belongs to believers. Yeah, yeah. See, the world can't have this power right here. This divine power that comes from God and to his people is passed to us for our use. He gives us, a matter of fact, a text of scripture I want you to look at is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. He talks about this particular divine power. I guess I ain't got that, have I? Huh? This is what it says. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his, of his inheritance in the same. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Look what he just got through explaining to us what he's trying to teach us and wants us to see. He says divine power or this particular power belongs to Christians. I've given you power and not just power he's given you his power right, see right. god didn't come and, and give us a, a portion or what looked like some of his power and gave us some of it he yes. gave us all of him yes, he says when you in me and resting in me you actually operating through me right. he says there is no enemy greater than you no problem should be greater than you no worry should bother you but when you're walking in christ right. christians we have no business being timid. Right. We have no reason to have this fear in our lives. Why? Because the Lord is our shepherd. See, you got to understand, 
when I got him, I got it all. When I got Christ in my life, when I made the Lord the head of my life, and I made the Lord my shepherd, that means because he takes care of me, I don't need nothing else. I don't even need another shepherd. I don't even lack a shepherd. I got the best shepherd it is. There are many shepherds on earth. But you have the best shepherd, which is the Lord. Ephesians 3 and 20. Let's look at that one. Ephesians 3 and 20. It says, oh, sorry about that, Daniel. I'm too fast. I get nervous. It says this. Look what it says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Power that works in us. You see that? Look what he says. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. There's nothing is unlimited what he can do. The power he gave you is unlimited. We have we, David says, David says in this psalm, he's trying to get us to understand because God is your shepherd, you don't need nothing else, you don't want nothing else, and you have been empowered to do everything. Your grumbling and complaining should be at rest. Put it to pasture. Leave all that complaining where it's at because you have the power to fix the situation. We're fighting problems that we don't even supposed to have. And then he says this, he says this, he says this, he says this. He says, above all that we can ask or think. You understand the things that your mind will get you in trouble doing when you start to thinking about. You understand how much trouble this can get you into when you start to think about things and, and worry about things and wonder about things. And I ain't made but $9.95, but I need $12.95. And I'm trying to wonder where it's going to come from and start speaking it and trusting what I got. Oh, I know you want to do that to me today, but don't worry about it. We're going to work with it. It says this, above all that we can ask or think, according, according to the power that works within us. He says, according to this power that's working in us. He didn't say the power that's coming to us is already in you. It's, it's basically like this. It's basically like having it's like having all the money you need, but sitting here looking for it. You got the money in your account, but you're sitting around worried about where the money going to come from when it's already there. He says you already got what you need. You ain't got to look for it. He says the power that works in us is already there in you. It's already working in you. When you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you, you were given a power and it's at work in you. It's alive and kicking. You ain't got to look for it. It's already there. He says, and the issue is with us, we don't want to enter into his rest, so we don't actually walk in his power. Now, he didn't say that we didn't have the power. We don't even walk in the power. I'm going I'm to I'm steal pastor sound now. It's wrapped up in me now. We're working out. So here's the thought. Here's the thought. In Ephesians, he's still making it clear what we needed to understand that we have a power in us. Zechariah 4 and 6. Zechariah 4 and 6 basically comes along the same way. Make a lot of noise, ain't I? I know the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide one way or the other. I hope I, oh, wait a minute. Ha, ha. Which one I cut off? I'm cutting too much stuff out here. What about now? That sound good right there, don't it? Almost made me think I sing when I heard that sound there, boy. I was trying to bust out a Marvin Winer song for you that faster. <laughs> My hallelujah belongs to you. All right, here we go now. Let's go back. Let's go back before I get in trouble here, y'all. So here's the thought. Here's the thought. In Zechariah, Zechariah says this. It says, so he answered and said to me, 
This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Y'all know my Greek and y'all know my Hebrew. Ain't that great, but that's what it means. It says this, not by might nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of all. God is telling you that I have empowered you with my spirit when you rest in me. If you rest in, in me, I'm in you, you're in me, and you are capable of doing everything that you need to do on this earth. He's basically coming along, and he, David says this. David's trying to get us to understand this spirit of fear is your biggest hindrance in life. He says we have a fear, and we won't enter into rest because of our fear. Well, he says not only should we just not and, and, and go back to 2 Timothy 1 and 7. You ain't got to move, Daniel. But back through 2 Timothy 1 and 7, what we're doing is we're looking at the parallel or the opposite of fear when God says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. He just got through assuring us of the power that he gave us, and now he wants to talk about this thing called love. He's given us a spirit of love. Believe it or not, he says it's a spirit. Love is a spirit. And listen to what he says about it. This is the love of choice and will. It's characterized by self-denial, self-sacrifice for the benefit of others, and it is the mark of a true Christian. Believe that or not, listen to what he makes sure you heard what I said. Love is a choice of will. It's not the emotion. We think we feel love, but the emotion comes out of the will or the act that you're doing. When you love somebody, your emotions will follow the act of love, not the opposite. I don't love him because you ain't trying to love him. I fell out of love because you stopped loving him. It ain't something that comes and goes. It's something that you choose. It's of the will. And look at what it says. And listen to the last, listen to the characteristics of what it said it is. It says, this love is characterized by self-denial. That's self-sacrifice. That's putting yourself second. You can't love nobody and love and put yourself before them. Love will make you do for people before you do for yourself. Love will make you feed others before you sit at the table and eat. Love will make you care about the well-being of others before you care about yourself. He says he wants us to understand this type of love, this spirit of love, what I gave my people. And not only that, listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He says, not only will you put others before you and deny yourself and sacrifice yourself, he says, your love should have a benefit for others. And then he came back and said, that's the mark of a Christian. When you got that in you, when you're walking like that in you, then I know you're a Christian. See, you ain't going to sit here and tell me you're no Christian and you ain't exemplifying this type of love. You can't be walking around with hate in your heart, hating people, and say you're no Christian. Because you can't be a Christian with hate in your heart. You can't be a Christian in your heart being selfish. No Christian, the mark of a Christian is self-sacrifice. It is self-denial. And for those of us who care about ourselves, and I got to do me first, I got to get mad, you ain't no Christian. According to the word of God, not my word right there. Don't walk out of here and say, Shelly said that. You walk out of here and say, the, the Lord said that. I ain't had nothing to do with it. I'm just agreeing with the Lord. That's why I say amen. Because my agreement is on the word of God, not on what I say. Oh, but don't stop there. Look what he says. This. I want you to hear this. John 13 and 35. John 13 and 35 says something. I want you to see what he said when he's speaking of this spirit of love. John 13 to 35, Brother Daniel, sorry about that. John 13 and 35, if you got a Bible, go to it. It'd be great. If you ain't, we can wait on technology. But look what he says. He says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He says, by this, oh, when you show love, exemplify love, exemplify self-sacrifice, people will know who you are. They'll see the Christ in you. They'll see what Christ did in your life and see you doing what Christ did. See, you ain't got to sit here and tell nobody who I am. You will see who, I'll see who you are. See, I think one of the main issues in the world today is we want to tell people and want people to assume we one thing, but our actions don't match up what we say. I want to look like a Christian. I want to sound like a Christian, but I don't act like a Christian. All right. mm, Ephesians 3 and 19, brother Daniel, give me that one. Ephesians 3 and 19. Ephesians 3 and 19 says this. 
It says, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And I like that one right there because it says this, to know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ. How many of us actually know Christ's love? To know Christ's love means to know what he did for you. That he sacrificed it all. And, and what I like about that is he knew what he was going to have to go through. He went to the Father and said, if, if, if this bitter cup can pass from me, take it away. But nevertheless, but nevertheless, he had a butt in his life. Christ had a butt in his life too. I don't want to do it, but I do it because I love him. Because of love will make me do it. And he says this, listen to what he says. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Pure love, true love, divine love. You can't figure it out. It won't make sense to nobody. It ain't, it ain't nothing that you can say that's going to make sense or I know why you did it. Yeah. See, because true love will make people do right to you when you do them wrong. And you won't figure out why they're doing it because you know what they did to you. When people do, you, do right to you when you know you've done wrong. Have you ever done somebody wrong and people been nice to you? Yeah. And you felt uneasy because they were doing good to you? You'd rather for them just to have done something wrong to you? I feel better if you just treat me back the way I treated you. Because when they treat you right better than them, you see, it goes past knowledge. Can't understand it. I don't know why they're doing that. Why they treat me this way? Man, I, yeah, I know I did what I did. I said what I said. I acted like I acted. But they're still showing love to me. See, he says, it passes all knowledge, passes the knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. He says this. It takes knowledge out of the picture and takes you back to trust in God. That's where you can come back to 23 and 1 says, I shall not want. I, don't, I can't figure it out. I don't want to figure it out because God going to fix it. The fullness of God in your life that operates in your life is a major issue that we don't have because we're missing on all these other commandments and all these other areas in life. We're still walking like we want to walk, so we can't meet the requirements God needs to give us what we got to have. See, they have to tell you that it ain't a bunch of Christianity, ain't no do's and don'ts and don't do do's, don't don't do's, but it is some do's in Christianity. There is a work in it. There's no work in salvation, but there's work in Christianity. See, I didn't do nothing to be saved. It was a gift. You don't earn a gift. He gave me a gift, but now I must work to be where I am. So don't think that you can sit on your laws because you accepted him and then you're going to grow. Because you can't grow like that without doing the work. First John 4 and 18, brother Daniel, give me that one. 1 John 4 and 18. Listen to this. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Fear is the issue at hand again. God said, it's this fear. It's this fear that we've got. He says, love is what's going to conquer it. But this love is something that you must choose. It's an act of your will that you got to do. It don't nothing. It just come. I don't love him. I don't really like him. I don't really love him. You ain't got to like him and love him. He says, you have to do it of your will. You got to want to love him. And when you find yourself wanting to love and you make your people. Boy, they just don't want me to do it today, do it. But it makes you do it. See, and the issue is this. When you have that love in you, when you have that particular love, it casts out fear. You know why love can cast out fear? Because of the sacrifice in it, you don't worry about it. See, when I don't care, when I have love in me, it's like I don't care what happened because God got it. The Lord my shepherd, and I don't want nobody else or nothing else. I only want what he wants for me and what he's given me. Because it said in the text earlier, we look back, we says is, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. So if you find yourself delighting in God, God will give you them desires that you need. And you know what? It ain't going to be them old fucking, oh, excuse me, ain't going to be them old desires you used to have. Because you know the ones you used to have wasn't amounting to nothing. 
what you thought you was or what you thought you was doing, what you thought you had to have, you found out you ain't need none of that mess. My desires in the world wasn't worth a quarter. All they did was bought me a ticket to hell. Until Lord called me, that's why I was headed with them old jacked up desires I had. Well, well, he, 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 he moved a little deep and he, and, 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 and he wants us to go to 1 Peter 1 and 22. And, and, and listen to this in 1 Peter 1 and 22. I, want, I, I still want to clear up this idea of, of this perfect love, of this love is of the will. I want you to hear it. 1 Peter 1 and 22 says this. It says, since you have purified your souls in the obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently. With a pure heart. He put pure there instead of in your heart. He says pure heart because he wants you to understand purity means not defiled with nothing else. Nothing else is in pureness. When it's pure, it's all clean. Nothing else in there. It's only one ingredient in it, and that's what he's talking about. Now bag that up, Daniel, for a minute. Bag it up, bag it up, bag it up, bag the screen up for one minute. I want you to show I want to show him something else there. Look what it says. It says, since you have purified your souls. Since you have accepted Christ, and since now you are purging out the old man, you're trying to accept the new man, you're beginning to do the new walk. He says, since I'm purified my soul in obeying the truth through the spirit. See, obeying the truth through the spirit. That means is we got to learn how to obey the word of God. See, you, don't, you can't obey, obey part of it and some of it and make it fit what you want to. We got to obey the spirit in its wholeness, not in partialness, in its wholeness. I can't forgive when I want to forgive and hate when I want to hate. I got to forgive all the time. I got to love all the time. I can't just love when it's complimentary or when it's good for me. I got to love you at all times. Even when it hurts or even when I lose, I got to obey it. But then not only that, he says this, not only that, he says, it says, obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love. He says, your love must be sincere. It can't have attachments to it. Your love got to be straight and pure. When you say you love somebody, I don't think we really understand what love really means. Songwriter wrote a song a long time ago. We used to hear back in the day. I want to know what love is. No, you really don't. No, we really don't want to know. Because... It's a command. Jesus commanded us to love. He didn't ask you to love. He said, this commandment I give to you, that you love one another. He didn't ask you to love me. He said, I command you to love him. See, we love because we want to, and you're dead wrong. He says, I commanded you to love. He says this. And he says, with a sincere love of the brethren. Woo, now that right there, I'll just shut the doors and put all us outdoors. Because we had the biggest problem loving one another. The terminology brethren means of like matter of Christians. In other words, Christians can't even love Christians. Amen. The most segregated day, the most separated day among all races. It ain't just us, it's all everybody. It's Christians, period. White Christians hate, hate, hate white Christians. Black Christians hate black Christians. Black Christians hate white Christians. We have a problem with everybody. He says, we're supposed to have a love of the brethren that draws the world in here. The world should be to see the love that we have for each other and break the doors down to see what they got going on in there. They should be saying, what must I do to get in on that? But the world looks at us and say, they just like us. What I'm going to come in there for? The game coming on at 2 o'clock, they don't, they don't get out in time for me to get to the game. The restaurants be too full to get something to eat. I ain't, ain't finna go through all of that. Love one another fervently, as the text says in 1 Peter. Here's the deal. This love is indicated by Peter is a love of choice. And it's the kind of love that can respond to a command. And when he says this terminology, this word where he uses it fervently, fervently means to stretch to the limits. Your love will get tested. It will get tried. You will get kicked. You will get hurt. You will get talked about. You will get used. You will get misused. You will get led astray. But that's the type of love that you got to have. No matter all of that they do to you, you still got to love them. We don't love folks if they take my bologna sandwich away. I quit loving you. I'll fall out with you if you eat my bologna sandwich at work. You drunk all the Kool-Aid up. I'll fall out with you over there. 
Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this last one in. I know, Pastor. You sit still, sit still. In the text, in the text of Scripture that we've been looking at and we've been dealing with, we've been dealing with actually 2 Timothy 1 through 1 chapter 7, verse 1 chapter 7. And the text actually reads that for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We're dealing with this spirit of fear because that's one of the problems that shepherds have with the sheep. Sheep will not lie down because they have fear. So we've been looking at fears. This particular text winded it down, and it says the last thing, the last thing that God gave us when he didn't give us a spirit of fear, he gave us the spirit of a sound mind. Spirit of a sound mind. Now, here's it go. This refers to a disciplined, self-controlled, and properly prioritized man. Listen to what I said again. It refers to a disciplined, self-controlled, and a properly prioritized man. When it says disciplined man, that means you got to check it what you're thinking. You got to control your thoughts. You got to control what's in here. And better than that, you got to control what comes out of there. It's up to you. It says this. A sound man means this. I don't, I don't let slip out of my mouth. I don't let slip in my mind what I'm thinking about. It says it's something that I have control. Do you understand you have control of what enters into your mind? You have control over what you do in your mind. Ain't no devil made me do nothing. You have control of it. And worse than that, born again believers have the power to do it. And we are the ones that actually are messed up with it. It says this, it says this, it says this. It says, this is the opposite of fear and cowardice that cause disorder and confusion. Focusing on the sovereign nature and perfect purposes of our eternal God allows believers to control their lives with godly wisdom. Listen to what I said. Focusing on the sovereign nature and perfect purpose of our eternal God. When we focus on who God is, then we can understand that. Now, you want to know where that comes from? Psalms 23 and 1, the Lord is my shepherd. When I put God in his right perspective, when I talk about God like he is, when I reverence him like he is, when I respect him like he is, then and only then, then and only then, he says, I can understand his sovereign ability and who he is and what he does for us. Bro, Holmes. Yes, sir. Ooh. Ooh. And you know, bro, Holmes, and, and here's the thing. I, I was taught, I think, I think, I, I, I had to get creative with creative to do, so I'm, I'm pretty sure he shared it with me, Pastor shared it with me when we were studying one time. He says, when people use that, the Lord knows my heart, you have to understand, he actually do know your heart. He know when you shucking and jiving and when you playing around and ain't doing what you're supposed to. See, we like to say, the Lord know my heart. That don't give you no excuse because I know you jiving with me. And it says, I shall not be mocked. You can't mock the Lord. And when you're doing that, that's what you're doing. You're mocking him. You're playing with him. See, because what? You ain't giving him his power. You ain't reverencing him as being God. See, when you play with him like that, you're trying to say, God sitting on the throne saying, man, that joker. No, that joker ain't. Like, I don't know what he really thinking in his heart. Yeah. You know you was wrong when you done it. Yeah. And that's the issue at hand. That's what we deal with. It says this. Listen, listen, listen to this last part. Now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to drag us through this. We're going to get out of here. Sorry about that, Pastor. I'm going to get you out of time. Here's the deal. It says this, this, this purpose of our eternal God, it allows believers to control their lives with godly wisdom. Amen. When you put God in his right perspective and you understand him and you get to know him, then you put him in proper perspective. Then you can walk in his godly wisdom. You can walk in what God has for us, and we can understand how we're to do what he called on us to do. You can't walk in his wisdom because you don't know him. Better than that, he can't be your shepherd if you ain't walking in his wisdom. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, if you ain't walking in his wisdom, he ain't your shepherd. See, because you don't really know him. He ain't your shepherd. He is the shepherd, but he ain't your shepherd yet. Until you make the relationship with him and get to know him, that's then and only then can he become your shepherd. Then he says this, then he says this, then he says this, he says, not only with godly wisdom and confidence in every situation. 
He wants us to understand when we start to walk with God, we enter into his rest and we begin to walk in his wisdom. Ain't no situation too great for you. Ain't nothing, ain't no problem that can bother you. But you got to enter into his rest to get it. And what happens is on the natural level, we still fighting it to do it our way. I got to get some rest today. I'm just tired today. You ain't going to never get no rest till you get the rest in him. See, no matter what kind of break you take, until you take that break in him, it ain't no break. See, if my rest is not in Christ, if my rest is not in God, then I'm not resting. I'm still resting in the natural. And if the Lord is my shepherd, I got to rest in the supernatural because it says the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want means I won't lack nothing. For me not to lack means I got to be a his. The greatest issue, the biggest problem that we're dealing with is he's not a part of us. David wanted us to understand in the 23rd Psalm, he says, the Lord got to be my shepherd, your shepherd. He can't be my shepherd and your shepherd unless you make him yours. He's greater, he's shepherd for everybody, but you got to get your part of him. Until you claim him and he's part of you, then he can't, it won't work for you. You'll be walking this earth trying to make things happen in the natural. And you know when you're trying to make stuff happen in the natural, you get natural results. Today things will work in your favor, tomorrow they won't. And you'll do the same thing over and over, but it'll never work like it's supposed to. Correct. To he that knows to do good and do it not, it's a sin. Not only that, it's, 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 it's the Lord, again, as we, as we dealt with this earlier, we tried to lay it out for you to understand it. God actually empowers us and gives us all good for us to have as his children. But if you won't receive it, what good is it? If I don't partake of the meal at the table, then I can walk around hungry. It ain't that the meal ain't cooked, it's that I won't come to the table and eat. See, the table is spread every day, every week the table is spread. Matter of fact, this table ain't been stopped, been spread. Even through pandemic, the table was spread. You had to turn it on, but the table was spread. It was there for you. This table in this church has been spreading since the doors, it, since the day it opened. Matter of fact, he went out of town and still left the church open. The table didn't even close then. Took the church to the promised land, to the holy land. And the church was still open and the table was still laid out. But you got to come to the table and eat. If you don't eat, what good is it? Okay, y'all don't be looking like that. <laughs> okay, all right. To a lighter note here, to a lighter note, to a lighter note, to a lighter note. As we wrap up, as we wrap up this rest that Jesus wants us to understand, the question that I hope you have answered in yourself, and, I, and, and more importantly, I, 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 I pray there's some steps that I want to give you, but I hadn't gave them to you yet. But some things that I want you to actually start to do in life, not only making a declaration over the word of God and start speaking the word of God to yourself. Don't just, don't just read it in quietness. Speak it and speak it out loud so your spirit begins to hear what you're saying. Your heart begins to hear you speaking what God has said. Then you can respond a lot different when you start to hear it. See, because it says faith comes by hearing. You got to hear it. You got to hear this word spoken to you. You got to say it, read it, read it out loud. So when you hear it, your response to it will be different. Then, then you'll be able to be what Christ called you to be. You'll start to look like him. You'll start to, you'll start to hearing him speak back to you. When you start to do wrong, you'll start hearing him talk to you. When you start opening that communication with him, start speaking the word out loud, saying things out loud, things out loud will come back at you. Then when you find yourself slipping off and saying that, he knows my heart. You'll catch yourself before you do that. And you'll start quit saying that the Lord knows my heart. And you'll start to say, I repent of this sin I've just committed against you. 
I start learning how to, I made a mistake. See, here's the issue. It's not that we can't make mistakes, but what we got to do after we make the mistake. Because we all still in the flesh. We still operating in the carnality. We still carnal, fleshly of the flesh. You're going to still mess up because you're stuck in this flesh. But the problem is, after you mess up, what do you do? Ooh, I thank you all this morning. The sun shining, even though it ain't shining outside, the sun shining on the inside. They are all in their places with bright smiling faces. <laughs> turn, it, <laughs> turn it over to the choir.
Good morning, New Horizon. Will all the members of New Horizon please stand? Members of New Horizon, please look all around you and wave your hands to all of those that are seated. And if you are seated, we are just so happy that you chose to come and worship the good Lord with us today. And any time that the doors of New Horizon are open, please do feel free to come and worship with us. Amen? Amen. New Horizon, you may have a seat. Church, say amen. amen. How is everybody feel? Isn't that a blessing? Amen. First of all, just to be alive, amen. to be able to breathe amen. God's fresh air, and despite the weather, it's good to know that y'all are not weather saints. Amen. I mentioned to Brother Shelley this morning. What what will we do if God just got Got to a point that he said, well, it's raining today. I'm just not going to bless nobody. Yeah. 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 Do want to remind uh, on next Sunday, um, Brother Holmes, Brother Figures, I am not uh, inviting another church to do what we at New Horizon are going to do. So when we finish on that Sunday morning, that will be it. But I'm going to give them their ordination uh, certificates. First of all, they have already been deacons before. And then I didn't want to deal with anybody saying, we'll be back. And then I look up at 3 or 4 o'clock and y'all at home. And then my blood pressure will shoot up, and, and I ain't got time for that. And so I figured the best thing to do is just get it all out of the way on Sunday morning. And I do want to remind the current deacons and their wives, as well as those that are becoming one for New Horizon, uh, 10 o'clock on this Saturday coming up, well, we will uh, know. It's on the 8th and the 9th, October the 8th. We will be in the fellowship hall at 10 o'clock. I mean, old floor room at 10 o'clock. And uh, we're just going to meet and greet so that they can get to know who we are and who's married to whom and the whole nine yards. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm encouraging all of you all. Uh, God is in the blessing business. Amen. And you see such a need. Now, I, uh, I, I looked at my phone, Brandilyn, and I didn't see anything other than an announcement from J.C. Penney's. And then Melanie pulled me to the corner there. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm hearing you correctly that um, my cousin's son and his wife are visiting with us this morning. And I just need Nick and his wife to stand. Amen. <laughs> we, uh, old man can't hardly see and uh, you know, your young folk change hairstyles. And then one, one thing I know, I'm bald, I'll be bald. So when you see me, you say, that's that bald man. But y'all hook it up. But we are just delighted and glad to have you all in our midst this morning. Amen. Amen. I think we covered all of our um, bases. We know that time is 
fast approaching and moving very quickly and before long it'll be Christmas time and we'll be out of this year and if it's God's will we'll be into 2023 what a blessing what a blessing and you actually step back and look at how looked like it was just yesterday and we were up in here bringing in 2,000 Now all those years have passed, and it has been a blessing. We've gone through some trials and some situations, but God has brought us all. And it is good just to be here. You can just pray softly. I feel the need to go ahead with prayer. So often we come to worship, and we walk right out the door with issues that we should have laid in the master's hand. That's like going shopping and walk out the door and you spent your money but you got nothing in your, in your buggy. And it makes no sense to come to the Lord's house and have issues on your heart and problems and situations and you walk right out of that door with the same issue. That's crazy. But if we learn to lay it in his hands, that's all we got to do. Just, just put it in his hand. Don't question how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it. Just put it right there in his hands. And I can assure you if you put it there and put it there right with the right faith, God will work it out. Sometimes God will make you strong and won't even touch the problem. That's when you learn how to ride a storm out. How many of y'all got the ability to ride a storm out? With every head bowed. God, you have been so good. You've been kind and you've been gracious to all of us. Your business in our lives. We just know that. You are in full control. And we yield our will and ourselves in your hands. God, somebody woke up this morning and the spirit is troubled. Somebody got a loved one that's sick. Some, somebody's dealing with death. But despite it all, we found out that there's absolutely nothing that Satan can come up with that you cannot handle. You said in your word that without faith, it is impossible to please you. So God, here we are. First of all, touch our unbelief. Help us to understand that you don't always operate the way we want you to. But you're an on-time God. And just when we need you the most, you got a way of stepping in. So we say, thank you, sir. God, as we lay our situations in your hand, help us to step back and just simply trust you. Your word teaches us that we are to trust you with all our heart. And it is dangerous for us to lean on our own understanding. In all our ways, we got to acknowledge you. So here we are. It's good to know that you got everything. So that God, when we depart from this place, on this Sunday, we can walk a little lighter. We can rest as Brother Shelley has taught us in your will so we say thank you now 
bless every person that's in this place that whatever they stand in need of and God we want to say thank you for a mind to want to be in worship thank you for allowing us to breathe your air and clothes on our back and a safe journey here thank you sir nothing we've done so outstanding that we can brag and boast about God somebody woke up this morning body was racked with pain but here we are somebody had absolutely nothing to eat but here we are somebody's naked but here we are you just been mighty good Thank you, sir. God, none of us know if we're going to be around next Sunday. But we thank you for right now. God, somebody's spirit is troubled. Take control. Help us to understand unless we lay it in your hand. It can't be fixed. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Let every heart say, Amen.
Let the church say amen. You may get your Bibles in your hand. Don't ask. You don't have to. I'm going to send you to where we're going to be on today. So just turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Then stand. For those of you who are visiting with us. On the screen, you will see a prayer of preparation, of meditation, and we read this uh, in unison so that we can prepare ourselves for the receiving of God's word. So at this time, let us read our meditation together. Dear Lord, I come before thee as an empty vessel. Open my ears that I might hear. Open my eyes that I might see. Open my mind that I might understand. Open my heart that I may receive your word. Our theme text, before you sit down, is actually taken out of Romans chapter 8, verse 14. And it is there that the Apostle Paul says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And we have been preaching, teaching on the theme, follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. You may have your seats. I'm going to make sure you understand. Uh, I've talked with Felicia. She... Uh, is on medication and thought enough to come on anyway and uh, need to go back home and rest. Amen. Uh, amen. So that is fine with me. I'm just, amen. 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 Let me quickly bring you up to speed as to where we are in relation to this series. Um, the Apostle Paul has already established two critical points for us, and that is he's made it clear that every born-again believer has two natures. There is the new you, which is the gift of salvation by which we have received our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. At the same time, Paul has acknowledged that Yet in us is that still that old nature. That is the nature in which we were all born with. And we've discussed the fact that both the new nature and the old nature are at odds with one another. And I wanted you to understand that that conflict is a conflict in which we must deal with for the rest of our lives as long as we are in this old feeble bodies of ours. And then, Sunday before last, I introduced to you a third person. And that third person is generally the area where many Christians will find themselves simply because we are not doing the things that are necessary for spiritual growth and development. And I call that third person the carnal Christian. So not only are we dealing with our new nature, not only are we focused on our old nature, but there is also within us as believers, as Christians, that spirit of carnality that exists. On last Sunday, I shared with you that the Apostle Paul talked to us about the description of carnality. And that came out of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. And it was in those verses we talked about the diet of the Corinthians. And where Paul says, in essence, that he was unable to share with them the major substance of the word of God because they were babes in Christ and had not grown as they should have grown. So we learned from that statement on last Sunday the importance 
of making sure we grow and develop and mature as God so desires of us. It wasn't that none of us did not understand starting out at that stage level as a babe in Christ is important. You don't try to sit down and give a baby a pork chop or a big piece of chicken. You, you know, I told you last Sunday, they on Gerber, but you don't stay on Gerber food. You want to grow and develop. On today, we want to continue our discussion. And keep in mind now that all of this, this is foundational material to help us understand what it takes to follow the Holy Spirit. These are prerequisites before we get into the step-by-step -step process. I want to continue that now that we know Paul has discussed the description of carnality in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1, 2, and 3. We want to move now and I want to deal with the danger of carnal Christians. And you can put underneath that the danger of carnality because what Paul now wants us to understand, he doesn't want us to remain in this state. And this is where many of us as believers find ourselves in a state of carnality. And this is a very dangerous state to be in, simply because you have no excuse to say, well, I, uh, I've been like this for a while. This is my personality. This is part of my makeup. No, it's not. We have accepted that which is wrong, okay? So now that you already have in your notes the diet by which these Corinthians had to receive, Paul now is going to talk to us about the danger of such a state for every believer. Looking now at verse 6 of the text, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul says to us. And listen attentively now so we can get this. Paul says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In verse 6, Paul is going to talk to us about the consequences of carnality. The consequences of carnality. Now, looking at the text, I want us to understand something before we even take an attempt to dissect and pull it apart. I need you to understand what verse 6 does not teach. Are we all on the same page? Verse 6 does not teach us that the flesh has one mind and the spirit of man has another mind. That's not what verse 6 teaches. Verse 6 teaches that we only have one man, mind. The problem is that one mind has the ability to deal with matters of the flesh or matters of the spirit. You take your pick. Are we together? So nobody's walking around with two minds. You only got one mind. When you look closely then at verse 6, dealing with the consequences of being carnally minded, what Paul does is make a contrast. He contrasts the carnal mind with that of a spiritual mind. Are we all on the same page? Now, when we dig deep and look at Paul's writings in detail, I want you to notice that Paul is going to present to us, out of verse 6, two important points. That means that the verse itself is divided into two powerful halves. Let's now take a look at the first half. And the first half deals with the consequences for carnality. Notice what I just said, the consequences for carnality. Please write it down correctly in your notes. I didn't say of, I said for. If you back up in your notes, I gave that 
description to the overall what? Text itself. That is verse 6. But for this first half of verse 6, we're going to focus on the consequences for carnality. Listen to what Paul says. For to be carnally minded is death. I need you to write down the word death. And the reason why is because since everyone dies physically, are we together? When I say everyone dies physically, I am talking about the man who has the spirit man dies and those that are without Christ die likewise. So that means then that the term death in the text must mean a spiritual death. Are we together? The word in the text must apply to the concept or the idea of a spiritual death. Why? Because both the unsaved person and the carnal Christian both focuses on the sin for interest of the flesh. Right. Let's stop right there. That means that there are Christians who are carnal in their thinking and they can't seem to shake loose their sinful nature. So the world doesn't see much of Christ in a carnal Christian. Well, I sure hope y'all get this. Are we together? And it's hard because what Satan likes to do is to bring up who you used to be and then he'll have you to remain attached to the habits. And this is how we somehow or another find ourselves making it work. You just don't know me. That's, that's been my personality. That's the kind of person I am. If you step on my foot, I'm going to get you back. Boy, y'all ain't got quiet up in here. There is no way whatsoever for us to have that kind of concept. So what I want to do is then look, since the word death means a spiritual death, let's talk now about the death of, as it relates to an unsaved person. Well, for an unsaved person, the term death, let's go to Isaiah chapter 51, 59, verses 1 and 2. Listen to what he says. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Boy, hope y'all getting this. Nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. My goodness, my goodness. That simply means that what that text teaches is that an unsaved person is separated from God now. Are we together? An unsaved person who has not the Lord is separated from him now. Now, if that person never does anything to get themselves right with God, that means that they move from being separated now to eternal death. Let me take you to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 14 and 15. The word says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we can come to the conclusion that an unsaved person is physically alive but spiritually dead. Let me say that again. An unsaved person is physically alive, but spiritually dead. So the person 
who sets his or her mind on the things of the flesh reaps death. This is why at homegoing services for folk that are born again, we recognize that there's a difference. I sure hope I'm making some sense. You don't have to tear up the church, fall apart for a born again believer. Because if you don't really know what's happening, death can look the same. But there is a difference. Because if you are unsaved, you just died and you are dealing now with eternal separation. See, that's why it's so important that you get right with God now while you got breath in your body. But we get so hung up on other folks' house, we fail to realize how you going to deal with the dirt at my front door when you got plenty in your yard, on your porch, and inside your house. This means that Paul is talking about the ruin of a person's soul as it relates to eternal condemnation. Are we together? So when Paul in the text makes it very, very clear to be carnally minded is death. Now, let's flip the coin. For to be carnally minded As it relates to the carnal Christian, what does that involve? Glad y'all asked me. Well, when Paul makes this statement, he says, first of all, it has to do with death as it relates to the Christian's spiritual Christian service. That means that it is when you are carnally minded, it's hard to work in the kingdom. Let me tell you why. People who are carnal-minded always raising hell. Boy, y'all ain't got quiet. Carnal-minded folk like to fuss. They like to bicker. They like to sit there and debate and argue over stuff that makes absolutely no sense at all. So their service in the kingdom means nothing. How can you serve the Lord full of hell? full of bitterness and anger and frustration. And what really amazes me, generally, hair raisers don't know they're hellish. And this is the way they do it. I just left a church that was hellish, you know, and I don't want no hell. You might be the hell that's... Secondly, It means the death of a person's spiritual growth. Some Christians remain infants simply because they don't see the need to grow, to develop. See, some things in life you ought to get past. If you already know you work around hellish, envious, jealous-minded folk, you you can't deal with that mess 24-7. What you have to learn to do is go to work and live above the hell you work around. Folk going to be hellish. They going to be mean. They going to be nasty. And it takes all you got to walk in the office and speak when you know you're dealing with backstabbers. You're dealing with ditch diggers. You got to speak anyway. Why? Because you have grown to a level that you know some folk just ain't changed their pampers. And it ain't just the same pamper, it's full of mess. Boy, y'all is. Thirdly, when Paul says, for to be carnally minded is death, it not only has reference to that person's service, not only to that of spiritual growth, but it also means their spiritual testimony. It's empty. And then it got their destiny. I, I want to say something for the Lord. And nobody is against a testimony, but you don't testify a lie. 
Boy, yeah. We come up with stuff to try to impress other people that, that we are born again. And, and you don't have to do that. If you just take the time to examine yourself, it's dangerous to be carnally minded. See, a carnal minded Christian will find everything wrong with morning worship. A carnal minded person got to critique everything other than themselves. I, I, I don't know why she got that on. Well, why you got on what you got on? See, because <laughs> you went to the mirror, but you didn't stand there long enough to look at yourself. Because you were too busy complimenting yourself, but downing and dogging everybody else. Carnal minded folk. So Paul, Paul in the text makes it very, very clear. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. God does not want his children, his children, to be carnal in their thinking. Are y'all hearing me? And, and, the, and, the, and the body of Christ lives right here. We, we, we got the meat on stuff that don't. Pastor baptized. It wasn't baptism Sunday. Oh, yeah. so, some of us right now just are uncomfortable because we ain't had communion in a while. But I'm going to ask you something. I, I'm trying to teach us now. Where in the word does it tell you you got to do it monthly? I want to know who started monthly yeah. communion. Yeah. Boy, y'all got quiet on the boy. Because if I came back and said we're going to do it every Sunday, now that's just too much. Yeah. That, 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 just don't make, that, that just don't make no sense. See, the point is, it's all about your comfortableness in where you are. If you don't take it but once a year, if your attitude is right, don't talk about enough blood. The blood has already saved me, and the blood will keep me. All right, all right, all right. So Paul moves from the consequences for carnality, and look at the second part of verse 6. It is now he talks about the consequences of spirituality. Watch the switch now. First half, carnality. Second half, spirituality. But now it is the consequences of what? Spirituality. Listen to what he says. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, this implies that a spiritual minded person focuses on matters of the spirit. See, if I already know that I'm dealing with me, Paul, got me? I'm dealing with me through the power of the Holy Spirit, and me ain't where me need to be. Does everybody understand? So I get what Paul is saying. The person here is obedient to the gospel, the word of God. Later on in the series, we're going to talk about why we can't follow the Holy Spirit. Because you can't lead somebody you don't know much about. When you don't know him, you can't follow him. But the more you know about him, the easier it is to follow him. So when Paul says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. He is talking about a person who is obedient to the word. Not quoting the word, obedient to the word. See, some Christians want to impress folk that they can quote scripture. That's fine. You got a good memory. But what good is a good memory when you can't practice what you're quoting? So I would much rather be around a person who got to open the Bible to find it, but they're walking it. Than one who can quote it, but ain't walking it. Watch the text. Notice now, in the text, Paul gives us two things as a result of being spiritually minded. 
Two, watch it in the text. He says, first of all, a person receives life. Then secondly, he says, the person receives peace. When Paul in the text uses the word life, he has reference to spiritual life. It indicates a spiritual union, a fellowship between the saved person and Almighty God. We sing, what a fellowship, what a joy divine. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. See, the issue is you can't have life without fellowship. And Christians can be some of the deadest, saddest looking folk. Got no joy, no enthusiasm, and then got the audacity to come to church and got to pump their behinds up. Why? Because we're so busy looking. Now, I don't know why she's shouting. I don't know why he's shouting. Well, why are you watching? What are you doing? See, it takes just that much to look around to see who is doing to discover you ain't doing. I got too much hell I'm wrestling with in my own life to waste time on somebody else. Boy, y'all are... Watch the text. Watch the text. This person has been raised then from spiritual death. This individual has now focused on eternal life. One of the things when we get into the steps of following the Holy Spirit, you ain't got no business worried and getting been out of shape because you're not looking where you are. You ought to focus on where you're going. See, you got sense enough to know that where we are right now, this ain't it. You can wake up every morning and sometimes God don't move a problem. He let it stay right there. But you got to look beyond the problem and realize soon and very soon. Oh boy, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. The person is spiritually alive and that person is destined for eternal life. So when Paul in the text says, but to be spiritually minded is life. Spiritually minded person not only possesses life, but peace. Boy, y'all better get it today. I ain't, I'm not even in a rush. I want us to get it. Too many Christians are troubled in their spirit. They walk around looking holy, but the spirit ain't right. They're troubled. Watch the text. I want to take you to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I don't want you to hear what Paul says. This is in connection to peace. Listen to what Paul says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in order to understand Romans chapter 5, verse 1, I want you to write this down in your notes. There are two types of faith. All right. Let me say that again. In order to understand Romans 5 and 1, you must recognize that there are two types of faith. The very first one is justifying faith. That is the faith in which Paul has reference to in Romans 5 and 1. So put that in your notes that way. Then there is the peace which has to do with sanctifying peace. So you got justifying peace and you got sanctifying peace. Let's take our time and explain this. In Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Paul is talking about justifying peace, which means we have our legal standing in God that cannot and will not change. Oh, I got a legal standing. So we are talking about positional faith. He moved me out of darkness 
and brought me over to the marvelous light. Now, since you think that I did all those things back in the day, you're correct. But what it is you don't know, I'm justified now. Because I'm placed in a new position. Now, you remember what I did. But he has erased. He has removed the old me. See, the problem with the old me has nothing to do with the Lord. It has to do with us. He has buried the old you. But we go back to the cemetery and dig up the old us. See, if I see you in the street and you rub me the wrong way, the old me, I run to the cemetery right quick, dig up me, come back, and cuss you out. And I can do that in a hurry. Really? You say, boy, he went there. He went to the cemetery quick. I don't have to go far. Because wherever the new me goes, you already know what? The old me still goes there. So I'm justified. You cannot deal with the kind of peace Paul is talking about unless you are first justified. Am I making sense? Oh, boy. I ain't got but a few more. Just a couple more bullets. I can't even finish all this. But you got to understand something. Justifying peace is powerful. So what Satan does is bring back stuff to your mind. When you mess up here, say, told you you weren't saved. You fall short, told you you weren't saved. And you can't believe that. Because what you must shot off of, I'm in a new position. Boy, yeah. I'm in a what? New position. Now keep in mind. When I move from over here in the old and I move to the new, some stuff dealing with the old me came in the new position. So every now and then, that old me rises up. But you cannot fall short thinking you ain't saved. You got to keep saying, but I'm justified. Go back to the text. Go back to the text. When Paul does this, I want you to understand all of the sins of the believer are canceled by God's death, burial, and resurrection from the grave. Am I making sense to you? And one thing Satan does is bring back to your remembrance everything you've ever done. And he loves to pick on you. And if you ain't careful, you'll start believing. Well, you know I. I did say something wrong. I ain't saved. Brothers and sisters, you, you, you say. What you have to do is follow what you've been taught. Ask the person to forgive you. And if the person doesn't forgive you, it's off you anyway. Boy, y'all. So when we look at, at Romans 5 and 1, I want to close on three things. I want you to look carefully now at the text. We're going to stop at this point. Look at what he does. There are three important points. First, what's found in, in the text is that Paul talks to us about the claiming of peace. Right. Now, I'm going to prove it. It's right there in the text. Look at what he says. Having been justified by what? Faith. That means that salvation is not by works. It's by faith. And guess what you got to do? You got to claim it. Poor y'all... This indicates that this kind of peace is only dealt with by faith. Am I making sense? See, when you're in the new position, there are times that the believer needs to make a claim on some things. Trouble all around you. Hell is breaking loose. But you need to do what the old folks used to do sometimes. Talk to yourself. You need to say, but I'm claiming peace. In the name of Jesus, hell is breaking. Has hell ever breaking loose in your life? You get trouble at home, trouble at work. Then you turn around. You can't find peace at work. Ain't no peace at home. Then stuff start breaking. 
Refrigerator ain't working. Stove ain't working. Boy, y'all sitting up here like every appliance in your house has always been working. Those things come at us because they're trying to snatch your claim. You got to claim. So Christians must claim this peace by faith. I know it's mine because I'm claiming it. I've been bought with a price. I got a right to claim it. I'm covered by his blood. I got to claim it. I know he know who I am. I'm just going to. So the first thing Paul presents is the claiming of the peace. The second thing. Secondly, there is the character of peace. Watch the text. Watch the text. Paul says we have peace with whom? With God. I want you to write down in your notes the words we have. Okay, let me tell you why. We have is in the present tense, indicating something that is already possessed. Now, I'm going to really mess with us. Satan knows that you've been shifted from your state of darkness and brought to a marvelous light. He knows you're in the right position. So now that booger is trying to mess with you. But what you got to understand is... You already know it came with the territory of the position. Look at the terminology Paul uses. We have. He, he didn't say you got to go get. Boy, y'all. We what? Have. That means that when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, when he put you in the position, peace. This justifying peace is yours. Watch the text. The third thing and final thing is the Christ. The Christ of peace. Got me? Write it in your notes. Look at what he says. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So peace with God comes through Jesus Christ and no one else. That means you can hit the lottery. And still don't have no peace. Because guess what? If you hit it good, you got to now come up with ways to avoid your family. Because you don't want to get nobody nothing. Boy, y'all got quiet up in here. And that's a headache all by itself. Now you make decisions that don't have nothing to do with it. Now you got to move. You're going to move away. You were born and raised because you got to go someplace else searching for peace when all you had to do you ain't had that much all your life. And you got to remember now none of us know the day nor the hour you can die that very moment. And guess what? You're going to leave it in somebody's bank or in some shoe box, or box in the cup. Boy, y'all done got quiet on me. This piece in this verse is associated with the idea of the fellowship I got with the Lord. I cannot have peace without his fellowship. Am I making any sense? I'm justified. So don't ever tell somebody they talking crazy. When you know you've been born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, you ought to claim this thing. When trouble come, claim it. Get to a point that you sit there and you say, oh, but wait one minute. I got this thing. So on next Sunday, on next Sunday, we ain't going no further. Next Sunday, I want you to write it down in your notes. We're going to talk about the conflict of carnality. That's found in verse 7. Got me? The conflict. Whew. Boy, y'all got some seeds that y'all can play with. You got me? We're dealing with the conflict now. And we're going to look at verse 7 of the text. And then hopefully we can get on to verse 8. And then we'll be ready to do some step by step what it takes to follow the Holy Spirit. But ain't no sense in following the Holy Spirit if you're in a carnal state. 
Because you're going to find every reason to put it on the Lord. The, the Lord just don't want to bless me. The Lord, the Lord, you know, I, I would have been better now, but the Lord just don't want to, you know, he, he won't bless everybody else other than me. I want to shut your mouth. I want you to get in a position where you realize God got some stuff in store for you. And he wants to do great things in your life. But you cannot remain carnal in your thinking. Am I, are you listening? I don't like hanging around carnal thinking people. Because if you got around somebody who don't like to claim stuff, you ain't going to have nothing. Boy, y'all sitting up here looking at me like a zombie. You got to get to that point that you realize some things you got to speak. I'm going to close on this. I'm going to close on this. I'm on a speaking engagement. Now, let me, let me tell you, it's going to sound crazy to some of y'all now, but just listen to me. Listen to me. There are some times you can pray, and God won't remove the pain. Right. Now, for those of you all who don't understand pain, you shut up. I don't need your input because you ain't never been there. Okay? So, in the morning times when I, when I wake up, this one kills me. This one aches like a toothache. This one has some pain, but it's hard to move my fingers. And they get stiff. And I've been praying and praying and praying and praying. And when it went and it came back and said, we're going to have to cut here, we're going to cut here. I said, okay, okay. But what he can't take away is my claiming. So I put my speaking above the pain. Boy, y'all. Uh, now, I told you it's going to sound so crazy. In other words, I had to remove my mind from experiencing the pain. And I have to repeat to myself, I got this. I got this. Sometimes we want to focus on what we think God isn't doing. When in reality, what God does is bypass the pain, and he'll work on the inner person. And anybody can shout when the storm is over. But it takes somebody to praise him, and the more you praise him, the more hellish the storm gets. Well, <laughs> that's when you know you're growing. Boy, yeah. How many of us live on just what we see? But when you can live out of this, when the, re when the mind becomes so renewed and disciplined that you say, the pain there, but I don't feel nothing. I have preached and was in pain, and then soon, about, about midway, it just disappeared. Then get back to the office, it show back up again. Boy, don't y'all tell me. It's almost like a toothache at night. You did all right all day long. Then when the sun went down, pain knocked at the door. Oh, but God. Okay, okay, okay. What, what, what Y'all got some? All right, good. Y'all got some. We, we should always be without, you know. Yeah. See, and, and before y'all. Yeah, I'm finna open the door before y'all sing. Let, let me help y'all. Don't y'all sit up in here. I'm, I mean this. And act all up in it. And can't do this. See that, that, see, that tells me that your mind is stuck right here. But just like in the old church, Lord have mercy. This was our instrument. Doors of church open. Y'all saying. I want to be a follower of Christ. You may come as a candidate for baptism, Christian experience, or by letter. Won't you come? I want to be one of his disciples. I want to walk in the newness of life. Do I 
accept him as Lord and Savior. What do I have to say? Acknowledge that you are a sinner. How do I have to walk? Walk in his will. <laughs> Each and every day. Tell me what does it cost if I carry the cross? Let me be a follower. I want to be a follower. Let me be a follower of Christ. That's what I'm talking about.